fragment of Posidonius, found in Book 5 of the Deipnosophists by Athenaeus of Naucratis, translated by C. D. Young, 1854. The Revolt of Athens from Rome in the school of Aramnaeus, the peripatetic, there was a certain man of the name of Athenion who applied himself very perseveringly to the philosophical discussions. He, having bought an Egyptian female slave, made her his mistress, and when she became a mother, either by him or by someone else, the child was bred up by Athenion and received the same name as his master. And having been thought literature, he became accustomed to lead his master about when he became an old man, in company with his mother. And when he died, he succeeded him as his heir, and became a citizen of Athens, being enrolled under the name of Athenion, and having married a very beautiful girl, after that he betook himself to the profession of a sophist, hunting out for boys to come to his school. And having pursued his profession of a sophist at Messene and at Larissa in Thessaly, and having amassed a considerable fortune, he returned to Athens. And, having been appointed an ambassador by the Athenian people, when the chief power in all that district was lodged in the hands of Mithridates, he insinuated himself into the good graces of the king and became one of his friends, being held by him in the greatest honor, in consequence of which he wrote letters to the Athenians to raise their spirits, as one who had the greatest influence with the king of Cappadocia, leading them to hope that they should be discharged of all their existing debts, and live in peace and concord with him, and also that they should recover their democratic constitution, and receive great presents both publicly and privately. And the Athenians boasted of all these promises which were made to them, feeling sure that the supremacy of the Romans would be put to an end. Now, when all Asia had revolted to the king, Athenion set out to return to Athens, and being tossed about a storm, he was driven to Charistus. And when the Cacropodi heard this, they sent some ships of war to conduct him back, and a litter with silver feet. And now he is entering the city, and almost the whole of the citizens has poured out to meet him, and many other spectators came together, marveling at this preposterous freak of fortune that this intrusive citizen, Athenion, foisted into Athens in such a manner should be conducted into the city on a litter with silver feet, and lying on purple clothes, a man who had never before seen even a purple patch on his ragged cloak. <laughs> when no one, not even the Romans, had ever exhibited such pomp and insulting show in Attica before, so there ran to the spectacle men, women, children, all expecting some glorious honors from Mithridates. While Athenian, that ancient beggar, who gave lectures for trifling sums of money, was now making a procession through the country and through the city, relying on the king's favor and treating everyone with great insolence. There met him also the artisans of the spectacles of Dionysus, calling him a messenger of the young Dionysus, and inviting him to the common altar, and to the prayers and libations which were to be offered at it. And he, who had formerly come out of a hired house, was conducted into the mansion of Dias, a person who at that time enjoyed great wealth from the revenues in Delos. It was adorned with couches and pictures and statues and a display of silver plate, and from it he issued forth, dragging on the ground a bright cloak and with a golden ring on his finger, having on it a carved portrait of Mithridates. And numbers of attendants went before him and followed him in procession. And in the plot of ground belonging to the artisans, sacrifices were performed in honor of the return of Athenion, and libations made with formal proclamation by a herald. And the next day, many people came to his house and awaited his appearance, and the whole Ceramicus was full of citizens and foreigners, and there was a voluntary thronging of the whole population of the city to the assembly. And at last he came forth, being attended by all who wished to stand well with the people, as if they had been his bodyguards, every one hastening even to touch his garment. He then, having ascended the tribunal, which had been erected for the Roman generals, in front of the stoa of Attalus, standing on it and looking round on all the people in a circle, and then looking up, said, O men of Athens, the state of affairs and the interests of my country compel me to relate to you what I know. 
but the greatness of the affairs that must be mentioned, owing to the unexpected character which circumstances have assumed, hinders me from doing so. And when all the bystanders called out to him with one accord to be of good cheer and to tell them, I tell you then, said he, of things which have never been hoped for, nor even imagined by anyone in a dream. The king Mithridates is master of Bithynia and of Upper Cappadocia, and is master of the whole of Asia, without any break, as far as Pamphylia and Cilicia, and the kings of the Armenians and Persians are only his bodyguards. And he is lord of all the nations which dwell around the Paulus Maeotis and the whole of Pontus, so that his dominions are upwards of thirty thousand furlongs in circumference. And the Roman commander in Pamphylia, Quintus Opius, has been surrendered to him, and is following him as a prisoner. But Manius Aquilius, a man of consular rank, who has celebrated a triumph for his victory over the Sicilians, is fastened by a long chain, a Bastarnian, five cubits tall, and is dragged by him on foot at the tail of his horse. And of the other Roman citizens in Asia, some have fallen down at the images of the gods, and the rest have put on square cloaks and acknowledge again the claims of their original country. And every city honoring him with more than human honors calls the king a god, and oracles everywhere promise him the dominion over the whole world, on which account he is new sending large armies against Thrace and Macedonia, and every part of Europe is coming over bodily to his side. For ambassadors are coming to him, not only from the Italian tribes, but also from the Carthaginians, begging him to enter into alliance with them for the destruction of the Romans. Having stopped a little, after saying this, and having given time for the multitude to converse together about the news thus unexpectedly announced to them, he wiped his face and went on. What then do I advise, not to bear the state of anarchy any longer, which the Roman Senate makes continue, while it is deciding what constitution you are to enjoy for the future? And do not let us be indifferent to our temples being closed, to our gymnasia being left in the dirt, to our theater being always empty, and our courts of justice mute, and the nicks consecrated by the oracles of the gods being taken from the people. Let us not, O Athenians, be indifferent to the sacred voice of Iacchus being reduced to silence, to the holy temple of Demeter and Persephone being closed, and to the schools of the philosophers being silenced as they are. And, when this slave had said all this, a good deal more the multitude conversing with one another, and running together to the theater, elected Athenian general over the entire army. And then... The peripatetic, coming into the orchestra, walking like Pythocles, thanked the Athenians and said, Now you yourselves are your own generals, and I am the commander-in-chief, and if you exert all your strength to cooperate with me, I shall be able to do as much as all of you put together. And he said this, appointed others to be his colleagues in the command, proposing whatever names he thought desirable. And a few days afterwards, the philosopher, having thus appointed himself tyrant, and having proved how much weight is to be attached to the doctrine of the Pythagoreans about plots against the others, and what was the practical effect of philosophy which the admirable Pythagoras laid down, as Theompopus has related in the eighth book of his Philippics, and Hermippus, the pupil of Callimachus, has corroborated that account, he immediately removed all the citizens who were right-thinking and of a good disposition contrary to the sentiments of and rules laid down by Aristotle and Theophrastus, showing how true is the proverb which says, Do not put a sword into the hand of a child. And he placed sentinels at the gates, so that many of the Athenians, fearing what he might be going to do, let themselves down over the walls by night, and so fled away. And Athenians, sending some horsemen to pursue them, slew some of them, and brought back some in chains, having a number of bodyguards about his person of the kind called cataphracts. And often he convened assemblies, pretending great attachment to the side of the Romans, and bringing accusations against many as having kept up communications with the exiles, and aiming at a revolution, he put them to death, and he placed thirty guards at each gate, and would not allow anyone to go either in or out and he seized on the property of many of the people, and collected such a quantity of money as to fill several wells, 
and he also sent all over the country people to lie in wait, as it were, for everyone who was traveling, and they brought them to him, and he put them to death without any trial, torturing and racking them into the bargain, and he also instituted prosecutions for treason against several people, saying that they were cooperating with the exiles to effect their return, and some of those who were prosecuted fled out of fear before the trials came on and some were condemned before the tribunals, he himself giving his own vote and collecting those of the others. And he brought about in the city a scarcity of the things necessary for life, depriving the citizens of their proper quantity of barley and wheat. He also sent out heavy armed soldiers over the country to hunt out any of those who had fled and who could be found within the borders of the land, or any of the Athenians who were escaping beyond the borders. And whoever was detected, he beat to death, and some of them he exhausted beforehand with tortures, and he caused proclamation to be made that all must be in their houses by sunset, and that no one should presume to walk outside with a lantern-bearer. And he not only plundered the property of the citizens, but that of foreigners also, laying his hands even on the property of the god at Delos, sending into the island a pelican of Teos, who had become a citizen of Athens, and who lived a most whimsical and ever-changing course of life. For at one time he was a philosopher, and collected all the treatises of the Peripatetics, and the whole library of Aristotle and many others, for he was a very rich man, and he had also stolen a great many original copies of decrees of the ancients, out of the Metroon, and whatever else there was ancient and rare in other cities. And... Being detected in these practices at Athens, he would have been in great danger if he had not made his escape. And a short time afterwards, he returned again, having paid his court to many people, and he then joined himself to Athenion, as being a man of the same sect as he was. And Athenion, having forgotten the doctrines of the Peripatetics, measured out a conix of Bailey as four days' allowance for the ignorant Athenians, giving them what was barely food enough for fowl, and not the proper nutriment, of men. And a pelican, coming in great force to Delos, and living there more like a man exhibiting a spectacle than a general with soldiers, and placing guards in a very careless manner on the side of Delos, and having all the back of the island unguarded, and not even putting down a palisade in front of his camp, went to rest. And Orobius, the Roman general, hearing of this, who was at the time in command at Delos, watching for a moonless night, let out his troops, and falling on a pelican and his soldiers, who were all asleep and drunk, he cut the Athenians and all those who were in the army with them to pieces, like so many sheep, to the number of six hundred, and he took four hundred alive. And that fine general, a pelican, fled away without being perceived, and came to Delos. And Orobius, seeing that many of those who fled with him had escaped to the farmhouses round about, burnt them in the houses, houses and all, and he destroyed by fire also all the engines for besieging cities, together with the Helopolis which Apelicon had made when he came to Delos. And Orobius, having erected in that place a trophy and altar, wrote this inscription on it. This tomb contains the foreigners here slain, who fought near Delos and who fell at sea, when the Athenians spoiled the Holy Isle, aiding in war the Cappadocian king. End of the Fragment of Posidonius Detailing the revolt of the Athenians against the Romans during the war against Mithridates, king of Pontus.